Maddie Hack is a uh, current uh, Yale undergraduate. Jake Burr, a recent uh, uh, undergraduate, now in the graduate program at Cornell. And Sam Snow, a graduate student in my lab. So I'm going to be talking about the evolution of uh, decadence by mate choice in Club Wing May. I'm going to start with uh, just making clear what I mean by decadence, a word that I, I think has a, or should have a place in evolutionary biology. And in particular, I mean decadence is a, is a consequence of selection that lowers the survival fecundity of all individuals in the population. So it's not merely a kind of maladaptation, uh, but something that's a, a, a reason why, why selection itself. So I'm going to be talking here specifically about the club wing mannequin. This is a bird that is singing with its wings. So that wing sound is actually a kind of stridulation. It's made by an interaction of the feathers. Um, in work by my former grad student Kim Boswick, showed with high-speed movies that the that videos that the the, the uh, feathers are oscillating over the back at 100 cycles per second, uh, and uh, colliding with one another and rubbing against one another. Now, what's interesting is that the sound is at 1,500 cycles per second. So we needed a frequency multiplier in order to create the sound. What happens is that these thickened uh, uh, secondary feathers that give the bird its name, its common name. Interact. The, the blade on the fifth secondary reaches over and rubs against these bumps on the sixth secondary, creating a mechanical stimulus which induces that feather to vibrate at the frequency of the sound. So uh, as they oscillate, these, these blades move up and down, creating that, that force. This is a kind of stridulation, and they could equivalently be called cricket winged uh, uh, mammals. Of course, these are polygynous birds, and this is a left display. Uh, and bird is uh, found in northwestern uh, Ecuador and, uh, and, and western Colombia. Now, in subsequent work, Kim Boswick showed that beauty in the clubbing mannequin is not only skin deep. This is a, uh, a micro CT scan, scan of a spirit specimen of clubbing mannequin, uh, showing the entire skeleton. And here we have a cross section right through the, the middle of the body. And you see here that the humerus, the radius, and the ulna are all solid, like ivory. Uh, this is extraordinary. This, uh, in fact, the, uh, even T. rex has a hollow ulna, right? That's how ancient these bones are. So it has very abandoned uh, uh, a, 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 an ulna design that is fundamental to all the birds. So here is a comparison of the clubbing mannequin male to a set of ulnas of other male mannequins. So these are the closest relatives. And indeed, not only is this uh, uh, ulna just sort of in shape with a widened shelf, with these huge uh, uh, quill knobs, the places where the ligaments hold the feathers attached on the bird. Uh, the, the calcium density is several orders of magnitude higher in the male than in the female, or in the other, uh, other mannequins. This is an extraordinary innovation uh, in, for this uh, amazing ornament. Um, but of course, this cost could be rationalized uh, as a kind of handicap. Uh, although we have no evidence that it is a non-linear cost, as the handicap model requires, we could be conceptualizing that this is just merely the cost of doing business and to be sexy for a bird. Uh, and that it reinforces the honesty of the bird. However, I became interested in the female club wing mannequins. What about her ulna? And how is it shaped? Well, it turns out that this is a very hard question to answer because these, these specimens are so rare. It turns out there are no skeletons in any museum of the world of this species. Um, it, uh, even though it was illustrated in the Santa Man by, by, uh, by Darwin. Um, and it, also it has a delayed plumage maturation. So most of the older skeleton, or older uh, skin specimens, would have been sexed by the, by, the, by the plumage. So we can't be sure that those old specimens are actually female uh, in order to do that. So we needed a modern specimens uh, that actually had an intact only inside of a skin. And we found those at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. And we scan them using T's hand to make the long story short. This is a, a Dicephia male that on the left, um, and male mannequin uh, or uh, male Macroptus here, and female Macroptus here. So the female Macroptus has a ulna of the same or very similar distorted shape as the male, right? Um, in, in cross section, however, we find that the female is uh, not solid like the male, uh, but it's still much thicker and has greater calcium density than other uh, ulnas within the family. Uh, this is unusual because 
Um, uh, these are potentially cost the female this pain, but it's not recouping through any kind of sexual display. So um, I'm going to explore whether this could be a, a decadent uh, evolutionary process that's given rise to this. So uh, first I want to ask how unusual are the club wing, female clubbing mannequins uh, all in shape? So here is a heuristic regression of a, a bunch of over 180 uh, flying species of birds where we've uh, uh, regressed uh, uh, the ulna width with ulna length, and the R squared here is 0.92. Uh, so there is really, really tight uh, 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 correlation or, or, or consistent shape in the ulna. <coughs> of course, this has been uh, understood or, rational or, or reinterpreted uh, for more than 30 years as strong evidence for, uh, for uh, uh, natural selection, conserving or preserving uh, a, a specific shape ulna for its function, in particular in flight. So how bizarre are um, uh, our mandates? Well, here's a, a, a slightly larger sample, including lots of, uh, of flying birds, uh, include, and also the penguin. And here are Macroptus siliciosus, males and females. Uh, just the addition of these few species leads to a lot dropping in the R squared down to 0.87. Um, how unusual are these? Well, it turns out that the siliciosus uh, is uh, three standard deviations more robust than the mean of these. Uh, uh, this sample of birds from across the bird phylogeny. The only one more extreme in robustness is actually the flightless uh, Sphiniscus penguin. So uh, uh, clearly very uh, unusual. Um, just for fun, I went down into the vertebrate paleontology collections and measured the ulnas of a number of flightless non-avian theropod dinosaurs. So here we have, and, 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 and crown birds, or, or basic birds. So here we have Archaeopteryx and Ichthyornis, uh, Rahona avis, uh, Solaris, uh, Deinonychus, all closer to the current avian average in robustness than is Macroptus deliciosus. Right, so uh, this bird has evolved in an extraordinarily new way in its, in its form. So these are all uh, uh, non phylogenetically corrected uh, samples. What happens when we take phylogeny into account? So uh, I didn't tell you, but our goal of samples were made so that we could do that analysis on this tree. And so what we did was a, uh, uh, an analysis to try to identify whether Macroxus deliciosus ulnus are evolving in a distinctive way from other birds. So we compared uh, 18 different uh, evolutionary models using Howie uh, of ulna shape or ulna robustness uh, evolution in birds, assuming either one, two, or three uh, evolutionary regimes of, of all birds, flighted and flightless birds, or flighted, flightless, and Macroxus deliciosus. Uh, here is an example of our models. We have a gravity of motion uh, models over here with uh, either one, two, or three regimes of change. We have a variety of Ornstein Uhlenbeck models, including uh, one with a single optimum, one, one, two, or three optimum, the same rates of evolution, or this goes uh, straight to selection or rates of evolution, and then we vary each one of them going through. The bottom line is that three, uh, three regime models are extraordinarily more likely than the others. Uh, with a great jump of, uh, of, of 38 AIC uh, between the, uh, the most uh, likely two parameter model and three parameter model. This one, the actual full model, we were unable to uh, converge on an answer. So this is strong evidence that Macroxus deliciosus is evolving in a distinctive way. It has uh, um, evolved in a, um, a new direction. So what do we think is going on? We think that females are selecting males for their attractive wings on. As a result, the male, the mate choice transforms both male and female wing bones. What I haven't told you yet is it turns out that wing bones in birds begin to develop in the embryo at day six or seven before sexual differentiation happens. So it's very difficult to find any genetic variation available for dimorphism in the bones. We can see, however, that, so this means that the females occur at some of the production costs, and I think very highly likely the functional uh, maintenance costs uh, to survival propensity of having a bizarre ulnar shape, although they will never display and directly benefit from, uh, from having those. So we hypothesize that reduction in survival and fecundity of daughters as a result of female choices for extreme wing songs uh, trades off against the sexual attractiveness of those sons. That the entire population becomes worse uh, uh, with a broader uh, 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 misfit between the functional necessity of flying and the, and the, uh, and the advantages of sex. So that the, uh, this creates a, a decrease in the functional fit of both males and females. 
So to see whether that idea is rational, uh, we developed a, uh, a, a theoretical model, which is an adaptation of Kirkpatrick's 82 model. Uh, we have two autosomal loci, for one for the display and one for the preference. Uh, uh, females that prefer, uh, ma uh, females with the preference prefer males with the trait, females without the preference mate randomly. Uh, in the original model, the viability cost of the display trait was found only in the males, and here we're assuming that there is incomplete uh, uh, sexual dimorphism or no sexual dimorphism in the trait, and then the males also pay the cost accordingly. The result is a slight change from the original uh, 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 arbitrary elaboration predicted by the Kirkpatrick model. In this case, uh, this is the solid gray line, is the line of the original uh, um, evolution of traits and preferences in, in, the, in the, uh, the, the line of equilibrium states, and we find that that line that continues to exist and is shifted to the right, and basically since the costs are doubled, they're being paid by both males and females, the frequency of the gene that's required for, it, for invasion is twice that, uh, and, the, and the frequency of the gene that's, that occurs at, at fixation is twice the original with that linear line in between. So the takeaways of the model is that females can incur indirect costs to their daughters by preferring male ornaments, and that this indirect natural selection on preference does not collapse the equilibrium line, but merely shifts it over. Costs of females for preferring male ornaments cannot be assumed to be a justification for the presence of adaptive mate choice in a population that an arbitrary Fisherian sexual selection is sufficient to explain this, and that there's no reason to presume uh, without other factors occurring that this could pre uh, uh, prevent, uh, 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 the species will be rescued from this decadent state. So indirect costs of preference can trade off with indirect benefits of, of sexual choice, of, 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 of traits. Mate choice can lead to a lower, lowering, or to true decadence, a lowering of the survival of kind of all individuals in the population. Either traits, and I think this is a, a real challenge for uh, for, uh, for honest advertisement. Traits are either costly, and females are incurring uh, costs that they won't will not recoup, which is decadent, or uh, these traits are not costly, and there's no mechanism to ensure their honesty. So this, I think, is a real challenge, we, something we need to explore further. Sexually selective decadence, I think, is likely to be common in nature. Uh, there's an old, uh, an old, an old, uh, an al an old discussion with, uh, uh, Darwin and Wallace, obviously, before they understood the genetics of sexual dimorphism about this, but we can see lots of cases, for example, in this gorgeous flower graph of Virgin Paradise, has a, a Wilson uh, Rescoop Dicolides Republica has a blue crown. The female also has a blue crown because Apteria gaps within the feather distribution again in the embryo early state. The crown of Rupicola requires changing the, the orientation of the feather follicles so that they create a central mohawk type crown. The female also has that. And in this case, uh, those are both occurring in the embryo. Here's the wire-tailed uh, mannequin, which has uh, uh, essentially monomorphic whiskers that the male rubs across the female, the face of the female during the display. She has them as well. So uh, if you find these uh, uh, issues inspiring, uh, curious, or enraging, you can get a lot more of it in a new book that I published on exhibit out there uh, just last month. Uh, thank you very much for your time.